Good evening and uh, welcome back, uh, inshallah, as we continue with our study of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If it's your first time joining us, welcome. We, uh, on Saturday nights, we get together as a community and we go through the names of Allah to learn about Allah himself uh, through his names. And uh, there are a lot of names to go through, so inshallah, we will be going through this series for some time. If you've uh, been joining us, welcome back, and hopefully, inshallah, we can continue to learn together. Uh, tonight, inshallah, I want to explore the name of Allah, Ar-Rabb. Ar-Rabb. And uh, Ar-Rabb, if we were to try to translate Ar-Rabb, how would we translate it? Anybody? Any guesses of how we could translate the name Ar-Rabb? The Lord, sure. Sustainer, yes. This is that this name is a comprehensive name. Ismun Jamiun Limaanin Kathira. It really um comprises of many, many meanings. And we hope to unpack some of these meanings, inshallah, uh, tonight. We could translate this name, Arab, as the master. The owner who arranges all affairs, all matters. The nurturer. The nurturer. The sustainer, as you mentioned. The one who is worshipped. The one who reforms his servants and their affairs. The one who bestows favors and blessings. Ar-Rabb. Anyone know how many times in the Quran this name is mentioned? Any estimate? What would you guess? 500, okay. Anyone else want to guess? 800, okay. I feel like I'm auctioning here. Anyone want to go higher? 2,400, okay. Over 900 times. Approximately 975, close to 1,000 times in the Quran. This name, Rabb, comes. What does that tell us? When Allah repeatedly talks about himself as Rabb, 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 Rabb. What does that tell us? It tells us, number one, he wants us to remember that. Right? Imagine you met somebody who's a doctor and they just keep saying, yeah, you know, as I'm a doctor, you know, since I'm a doctor, you know, uh, since, since the time I became a doctor. At the end, you're like, okay, I, 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 it's clear you want me to remember that you're a doctor. Because that's important to them. That's important to them, right? Is they want you to know that. When Allah tells us he is Rabb over and over again, he wants us to remember this. He wants us to remember that he is the Rabb. Now, what does the name Rabb mean? Ibn Ashur, one of the great commentators of the Quran, he says the word Rabb, it comes from the same roots that you get the word Tarbiyah. Anyone want to know what, want to... Wanna, Share what tarbiyah means? Because you have this word in other languages as well. Yeah. Discipline. Okay. Sorry. To nurture. And these are related, by the way. Discipline does, you know, when we hear discipline, a lot of us think punishment. How many of y'all, when you hear discipline, you think punishment? Yeah, because it's kind of how we use it. I'm going to discipline that person, right? Discipline really means to teach. That's where we get the, name, the word di disciple. A disciple is a student, someone who learns. So disciplining is truly about teaching. Any disciplining where there's no teaching intended or involved, that's just punishment or that's just venting your anger. And there's a huge lesson for us parents in that is when I discipline my child, what's my intention is it to let out my anger? Because I'm really upset. 
So it makes me feel better when I can just let it out. In the process, our children can sense that we're coming from a place of fury. We want to see them hurt. Whereas discipline, it's not about letting out my anger. Discipline is to ask myself, what will get my child to understand the mistake they made and what the right thing to do is? That might involve a little bit of, one could say, uh, firmness. It might involve that. But as a parent, one who is truly disciplining, we will approach that firmness with measure. It will not be to pacify our own anger. It will be because we truly want the child to learn the lesson. So discipline and nurturing, what else, what else does tarbiyah mean? How, in what context do we use the word tarbiyah? Anyone? Parenthood, the idea of what? Bringing up a child, doing a child's tarbiyah, we say. Ibn Ashur, he defines tarbiyah. He says it's tabligh shay'i ila kamalihi tadrijan. It is to take something and gradually take it through the di different phases and stages until it reaches its final form. That's what tarbiyah is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ar-rabb. The one who does tarbiyah. This is important. Sometimes as parents, we put so much pressure on ourselves that I have to guarantee the success of my child. I'm not denying that parents have a huge responsibility. But sometimes in our anxiety about how my child will turn out, we attempt to control all variables to try to guarantee a particular outcome with my child. And this can lead to, you know, helicopter parenting, where we're just constantly hovering over our child, won't let them make a single mistake or stumble. This can lead to bulldozer parenting, where we remove all obstacles from our child's path so that everything's easy for them. But then what ends up happening? They don't know how to recover from mistakes because they, they were never allowed to make any mistakes. And they don't know how to overcome obstacles. Why? Because we removed all obstacles from their past. As though we believe as parents that if I can just guarantee that my child has the easiest, simplest, most stress-free life, that they will turn out perfect. The reality is that's not the case. That's not what our responsibility is. It is not to guarantee outcomes. That, you know, one of, one of my teachers, he said, your duty as a parent is to prepare your child to make the right decisions. What does that mean? It's taking into consideration the reality that every child will eventually reach an age where they will get to choose what they want to do. The day will come where the child will leave home, right? 18, 20, 21, 25. Eventually they'll leave. They'll have their own house, their own family. What will they do? If all we train our children to do is to do the right thing in front of me, that when I'm looking, you, you better be doing the right thing. In front of me, you will pray all your five times prayers. Why? Because I'm watching. You will speak the truth because I'm watching. You will avoid X, Y, Z, haram because I'm watching. What happens when you're not watching? What happens when the day comes and the child leaves home? And they're not ready to make these decisions. We cannot forever be around our children. So what's our responsibility? Prepare them. Train them to make the right decisions. Give them opportunities. Give them some space. They go with friends. They're, they're 13 years old. They go with friends. Might they make some bad decisions? Yes. 
but we can also train them to make the right decisions. They might make the mistake. Okay, come home at nighttime. Let's talk about it. What happened? I thought we said we wouldn't do that. What ended up happening? Oh, so another friend joined and you were influenced by that friend. Ah, so now we learn that we have to be careful who we accept influence from. And you help them learn how to make the right decisions. That's the duty of a parent. Because you could imagine, imagine for 18 years, you kept your child at home and you watched their every movement. movement. You made sure that they prayed five times a day, that they never lied, they never watched anything haram. You, you were like a hawk. You watched everything they did. And eventually, when they leave your house, then what? Then you have to sit at home and your child is in his house or her house, free to do whatever they want. And then what do you do? So parenting is not about guaranteeing an outcome. It's preparing the child to make right decisions. Well then, Shaykh, but it's stressful. I'm worried about my kids. That's where we understand Allah is a Rabb. That's why as parents, Allah blessed us with what? The ability to have a dua that's accepted. Immediate acceptance. Put my hands up. Make dua for my children every day. Ya Allah. Protect them, guide them. Ya Allah, protect them, guide them. I can only do so much, Ya Allah. I can only do so much. I'm going to do my best, Ya Allah. But I know truly the one who determines outcomes is you, Ya Allah. The true being who does tarbiyah is you, Ya Allah. And as a parent who thinks about the world that we live in right now, man, it's overwhelming at times. I'm trying to send my child into this world. The challenges. What can give you peace? Allah is Rabb. Allah, you're the one who does tarbiyah. Does that make sense? And in that way, subhanAllah, we, we adjust the locus of control. It's not fully internalized where it's all on me. You know, as a parent, as a father, as a mother, sometimes you just feel, am I doing the right thing? A lot of self-doubt. Am I doing the right thing? Am I being too harsh? Am I being too lenient? And you're constantly doing that. And you're scared. You're scared. I don't want to traumatize my child. Right? You get a little upset one day. You're like, oh no, for now, now they're forever scarred by that one time I blew up. Do you get it? You have this worry. Remembering Allah is a Rabb, that he is the one who brought up Musa in the house of Fir'aun. He brought up Musa in the house of Fir'aun. He turned into Musa because he is the Rabb. He's the one who brought up the child of Nuh in the house of Nuh. And the child of Nuh, a prophet, was not guided. Was the prophet, was he deficient in any way in his tarbiyah? No. Allah had made him responsible for the tarbiyah of a nation. He's a prophet, responsible for what? For guiding a whole nation, working and inviting a whole nation. Da'wah. Of course he could, you know, he was capable, absolutely, to do tarbiyah of his own children. We learn a lesson though. Is you don't guarantee the outcomes. This also keeps us humble. If your child is successful, it's not about patting ourselves on the back. Oh, but I made all these right decisions. Oh, there's many people who made good decisions. Their child didn't end up that way. And there are many people who made bad decisions, seemingly, and the child turned out pretty good. So we, we don't pat ourselves on the back. We say, you know, all praise belongs to Allah. You know, my child, whatever good comes from them, all praise belongs to Allah. We did our best, but truly the one who guided them and, and took them forward, it was Allah. And it keeps us humble. Do you get that? And it also, also, it keeps us as parents. I'm sorry, guys. I, I have three kids, so like I'm always switching into parent mode. Some of y'all are like, I'm not even married, yo. Like, what are you telling? As a parent, I'm telling you, it just takes over. You start looking at everything from a parental lens, you know? Like, you don't even notice, like, sport check anymore. All you notice is Toys R Us. You know what I'm saying? Like, you're trying to, like, take the road that doesn't have Toys R Us. Um, it, it just takes over. So, um, the point I'm making is that 
Another thing for us is you never give up hope with your children. You know, I've had parents come to me, subhanAllah, they, they talk to me about maybe for 20 plus years they made mistakes with their children. Maybe they were just way too intrusive, no autonomy to their child. And their child is what? Turned away from the religion. Because it's always forced on them. I say child, but like we're talking 25 year old, 30 year olds, right? Like grown adults. And the parents come and they say, I'm worried. My son or my daughter has moved out. They're 25, they're 30 years old, and they don't even pray. What should I do? And they say, Sheikh, for, for 25 years, I nagged them every single day to pray. They don't pray anymore. What do I do? What do you tell them? I said, you know, there's these amazing people at Isna. I'm going to ask them and get back to you. So come on, help me out, guys. I'm just joking, by the way. What, do you, what, what would you tell that parent? Yeah. Sure. Well, they want to do something, though. You're right. I could say make dua. Okay, anything else? I told them, stop reminding them. Stop nagging them. Stop, because they said, when, when, my, when, when, when I call my son or my daughter and they pick up, I say, did you pray Jumu'ah? I say, stop. You know how difficult that was for the parent? They were like, no, Sheikh, I'm trying to get them to pray. And you're telling me, stop telling them? I'm like, yeah. I'm like, yeah, it's a negative association. They're going to continue, they're going to continue to see you as someone trying to control them. I say, you know what? Show them love. That's it. Just love. Ask them how they're doing. Ask them if there's anything you can do for them. Ask them, hey, I'm here for you. Anything you need, let me know. And that was so hard. Because they just, they just wanted to see change. You know, one of the things about tarbiyah that we learn right here is that it means gradual change. Tadrijan. The Rabb is the one who gradually takes you through the stages of life. He doesn't demand instantaneous growth and change. So as parents, knowing that Allah is Rabb, even when our children may seemingly go in a certain direction, we don't give up hope. Even when we don't know what we can do to bring them back, we turn to Allah. Allah, you are truly the Rabb. You're the one who nurtures. Ya Allah, I ask that you guide them. And it's crazy, subhanAllah. The power of a parent's dua that's seemingly just giving them space. Giving them space. Giving them autonomy to choose the religion for themselves to make that decision I was talking about. To make that decision. So often we see this child find their way. It's so incredible. If the parent can learn to what? Just pull back. And not hover over them continuously. Thinking, if I, just, if I just get on them a little bit more, they'll finally understand. It's like pull back. The reason why we don't pull back is we think we are the ones who guarantee the outcome. Pull back. Give them space. Show them love. They've been pushed away through. And I know, here's the thing. You can care about someone, but you can fail to convey to them that you care. Remember that. In life, you can care about someone, but you can actually fail to convey the fact that you care about them. I see this so often. Parents care so much about their child, and their child thinks, my mom or my dad hates me. Where's the disconnect? How is it that this parent loves so much and yet is not able to convey to their child that they care? The child sees it as, controlling or intrusive, right? Just not respecting my autonomy, not respecting my boundaries. These types, you know, these conversations come up. So as parents, it's important that we recognize Allah is the Rabb. And change takes time. Allah does not demand, He is Rabb, Tarbiyah. He does not demand immediate change. Immediate change. That's why even when people accept Islam, even when people accept Islam, it's a gradual process. 
it's not from day one you start cutting them off and like, hey, you need to divorce your partner. And like, that's not how you do it. There's wisdom gradually, gradually, slowly, that they can adapt. Even Islam, when it was introduced through the Prophet ﷺ, was gradual. That's what tarbiyah is. Tarbiyah is to gradually. That's why the Prophet ﷺ taught us, at what age do we command children to pray? What's the age? Seven. Not because they are required to pray. Usually they're not required to pray when they're seven. Right? You know, my daughter, until she was seven, she held off. We're like, hey, you can join us if you want. She's like, nope, until seven. It's like, I got until seven. I was like, okay. Right? Like, she knows the hadith. I was like, that's the last hadith I'm teaching. I'm just joking. I'm joking. Right? They'll use the hadith against you back. I was like, okay. okay I get it. You know? He, he said, command them to pray when they're seven. But recognize that they may not pray all the prayers. Recognize that they may not pray all five of them every single day. It takes time. And so many parents will introduce like two prayers. Eventually, eventually add more and more and more. And then by the time they're 10, the Prophet ﷺ said they should have developed a habit. See, three years to develop a habit of praying. Three years. But it takes time to get in the habit, for the, for the nafs to adapt. You know, <laughs> I heard about this one, uh, this one parent. He brought his 13-year-old son to the masjid to talk to the imam, and he was like, Imam, my son's a munafiq. <laughs> he goes to him, my son's a hypocrite. He does this, but then he does this. The imam was like, relax. Your son's 13. 13. Give him 20 years. Give him 20 years. Let him develop. Let him learn. Let him understand. Move on. Grow. And then we'll see if he's a munaf. He's 13, man. He's just still learning the basics. Give him time. But we want saints at 12. It's not going to happen. It's going to take time. I understand. Hold, hold high aspirations, yes. But also acknowledge that we're dealing with humans, not robots. You can't program them one day and the next day you'll see, boom, into action. It's not how that works. Allah is the Rabb. He does not demand overnight change. Right? Now, we... We must become content with the fact that Allah is our Rabb. In the hadith of Sahih Muslim, it's mentioned the Prophet ﷺ said that ذَاقَ طَعْمَ iman that, that individual has tasted the sweetness of Iman who has three qualities. Number one, مَنْ رَضِيَ بِاللَّهِ رَبَّ Who is content with Allah as their Lord. And with Islam as their way of life. And with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam as their messenger. Like if these three things just totally make sense to you and you're totally at peace with them, you'll taste the sweetness of Iman. Um, Al-Imam al-Nawawi when he explains that this idea of sweetness of Iman. Notice the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam didn't say you'll, you'll, you'll feel strong Iman. He didn't say like you'll have really high iman. He didn't describe it in intensity or height or something. He said a sweetness. Like there will be a sensory pleasure. Al-Imam al-Nawawi, he says, what does this mean? Sweetness of iman. He says, istilvadu ta'at. You'll find obedience to Allah. You'll find obedience to Allah enjoyable. How many of us say that, well, if we're honest, we don't really find that. We find it difficult. And a lot of times it's because we haven't trained ourselves. Anyone here guilty of getting into things too quickly? Anyone show of hands? We're like, you pick up a new hobby and you go from zero to 100. And in three days you want to be like that person who's been doing it for like, you know, six years. Right? Because you walk in, you're like, yo, if they can do it, I could do it. Not realizing they've been doing it for six years. And we walk in and we're just like, okay, if I just, if I just push harder, I'll be able to do it. It's like, chill there. Right? People go in and they go all out. 
when it comes to our worship and our relationship with Allah, it takes time. And if we push ourselves too hard, we burn out. Ramadan's a classic example. The whole year we chill, Ramadan rolls around, and we start going hard in the first few days because we're, we're pumped, and then we burn out because we haven't built up that capacity. But when a person sticks with something consistently, they build up the capacity, they find enjoyment, enjoyment in things that other people would find really difficult. And I'll give you an example. How many of y'all, how many of y'all run? Any runners here? My hand is up to encourage. My hand is not up because I'm a runner. I'll just be honest with you. Okay, mashallah, got some runners? Yes, mashallah, mashallah. Um, why? <laughs> why? Why do you run when your lungs are burning? You ever seen people who run at 4 a.m.? If you download Strava and just check people in your neighborhood running at 4 a.m. and they're running 10K every single day, like, who does that? Who hurts you? Right? Like, what's people? But they enjoy it. They talk about a runner's high. I'm like, yo, someone needs to talk about the runner's low, yo. Like, you know, as soon as you start running, is you feel it. Do you get what I'm saying, though? How did they get to a point where I'm going for a run to clear my mind? Really? Like, I have the total opposite. Right? In COVID, none of y'all got on that running vibe in COVID? Come on now. Everybody was like gardening and running in COVID, right? No? Just me? Okay. Um, but how does, how does a person get to that level? To the point that they enjoy it? Something that most people would find to be so painful, so difficult, is... They don't usually, they don't start from 10 kilometers. They start from one, two, three. They start from walking on the treadmill and they start walking with incline, right? And then they start going for a run outside a little bit and they build up. A lot of people fail not because they're not in shape, but they push themselves too quickly. So the tendons and the ligaments can't, can't the muscles are good. It's the tendons and ligaments that, are not, that haven't adjusted. And so then a person injures themselves. The same thing happens. Why don't we taste sweetness of Iman? Because we don't build ourselves up gradually, slowly. You know, let me, let me build a habit of doing a little bit. Just let me start with five prayers. The day we want to change our lives, we go from five prayers plus fasting plus giving sadaqah plus attending the halaqah and then, whoa, no. Slowly but surely. See, a lot of us also think the linear, the, 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 the growth of religiosity is like linear. It's just, you just grow up, 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 and that's it. And it's just not the case. With everybody, even the scholars of the past, it's up and down, and up and down. And the goal is that the dips should never, or should not rather, continue to be you know, low. The dips should get lower, sorry, higher. So when you dip, you don't dip all the way back down, you know? And, 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 you, and you continue gradually. Over years, you make progress. It takes time. It takes time. And so the sweetness of faith where we start to find pleasure in the obedience of Allah comes when we gradually implement and introduce religiosity into our lives. This is what we mean when we talk about a journey. Some people say, like, what do you mean it's a journey? It's halal or it's haram? It's fard or it's not fard? What journey are you talking about, Shaykh? We're talking about a psychological journey where psychologically I, I've reached a point where I'm confident enough to take this step. Where I'm confident enough to take this step. Even when it comes to accepting Islam, you have to be careful and, and like gradually, you don't push people, just accept it. They accept it too quickly, then they start to feel, was I pressured into this? Wait, why did I accept this? Oh, this person is just trying to get me to join a group. And they can actually pull back. And so we have to give people their space while gently nudging them. And that's the approach with, you know, each other, is give people space, recognize it'll take time, but gently nudge them when they get a chance. The Prophet ﷺ in the hadith of both Bukhari and Muslim, he said, 
if you have three qualities in you, you will taste the sweetness of iman. The first, this is a different hadith, by the way. That the being that you love the most, more than anything, is Allah and then His Messenger. Again, sweetness of Iman comes when? What's one of the signs of it? That you find enjoyment in, in worship and obedience to Allah. You're happy to give something up for the sake of Allah. But also, you, you find it easier to bear hardships for his sake. That when Allah sends a difficulty your way, one of the signs that a person tastes the sweetness of iman is that they say, what? It's painful, but ya Allah, for you, I'm ready to make the sacrifice. If you see my, my struggle, I'm happy. Sometimes that's all we want, isn't it? Sometimes all we want is for people to recognize how hard we're trying. That's one of the greatest pains, is when you work really hard and your effort's not even acknowledged. Forget the results when you don't care about school, right? You tried so hard, yeah, you failed, but you tried really hard, you did your best, and then your effort's not even acknowledged. Yeah, you don't care. You're like, no, I care, man, I do. Don't, don't deny that. Okay, fine, deny the fact that I didn't do well. It's true, I didn't do well. But acknowledge that I'm trying. That's all we want sometimes. That's why parents remind their children about how hard they're working. I go to work every day. You know, they remind their children why. They just want recognition that, hey, as a dad, as a mom, I care about you. Look, I'm not a perfect parent, but like, give me the credit that I try. And that's all we want. We'll go through hardship if the person that we love will acknowledge our efforts. With Allah, that's a sign that you taste the sweetness of iman. That I'm giving this up and it's so painful, ya Allah, but, but it's for your sake. It's for your sake. And if you're pleased with me, you see my efforts, you acknowledge it, ya Allah, it's worth it. That's a sign. That's a sign that you have sweetness of iman. That you're willing to do that. The first quality he said is that you love Allah and his messenger more than anything. And you love them solely for the sake of Allah. The second is what? That you love someone else for the sake of Allah and nothing else. That there's somebody in your life, a friend, a fellow Muslim. This hadith says, Abdan, a servant. Waman ahabba abdan. Yani, any person, not necessarily according to this hadith, even a Muslim, but you love them for the sake of God, for the, for the goodness they might have in their heart, for the good qualities they might have. And the last thing is, being on the wrong path, you dislike moving back towards that path the way you would dislike to be thrown in a fire. Meaning when Allah saves you, you have such a deep appreciation for that, that you're like, look, Ya Allah, I know I, I'm trying to be on the straight path, I'm really struggling, it's hard, but Ya Allah, one thing I commit to is that I'll never go back to that. That life you saved me from, Ya Allah, I won't go back to it. Because I can't. After tasting this, I can't go there. That's a sign someone has sweetness of iman. Allah is Rabbul Alameen, the Lord of everything created. He starts the Quran with this. Let's, let's, let's take a moment to think about that. When we meet somebody for the first time, how do we introduce ourselves? Like I don't meet people and go, hey, my name is Osman and my middle toe is crooked. Right? Like, that's not what we do. It's not, by the way, I'm just saying, right? We don't do that. We don't say some random fact. What do you share with people when you first meet them? What do you share? Your name? Occupation? But essentially, what, how do you choose what to share? You share based on what? Best foot forward as well as what we want them to know about me. What we want them to know about me. Allah begins the Qur'an, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Rabbil Alameen. I started from Alhamdulillah, right? That's a Hanafi thing, but yeah. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. All praise belongs to Allah, the Rabb of all the worlds. That's the first impression he wants us to know is, I am your Rabb. 
Now, when we think about Rabb, and Rabb of what? All of the worlds, everything in existence, the cosmos. I mean, that's a great Lord. That's a great, great Lord. And when you hear of such a great Lord who, who controls the affairs of everything, so much power, so much control, you can be overwhelmed. And so then what does he follow that up with? No, d- don't be scared. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Ar-Rab, who when he does tarbiyah, he does it with rahmah. He does it with rahmah. What does rahmah mean? We translate it as like merciful, compassionate. Let's understand something here. Rahmah in compassion does not mean to give someone whatever they want. It's not permissiveness. This is important because this will separate our understanding of mercy from, you know, Christian understandings of mercy. It's not to give someone what? Everything that they want. Just make them happy all the time. That's not, that's not mercy. Sometimes when we're going through difficulty, we say, well, yeah, Allah, where's the mercy? And it's ajib because in the struggle is the mercy. You say, how is that possible? What do you mean? Someone who loves you and shows you mercy puts you through difficulty? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. As parents, it's not good to be a permissive parent. To give your child everything and whatever they want. Just whatever it takes to keep them happy. You ever heard that? Like give them, just don't let them cry. Give them whatever they want so they don't cry. And that's a sure way to spoil that child. To give them everything all the time and never ever put any limits to them. What happens when you put a limit to that child or to a child? They push back. No, you're not allowed to do that. They get a little bit upset. Why not? I want to do this. But you're holding them back from what? What's good for them. Mercy is to do what is in their best interests, not to do what they necessarily want. How many of y'all have children who've wanted to play with the scissors or the knives? Or siblings? Y'all ever had anyone like little kid who wants that? And you say what? You say no. And they start crying. And they're like, where's the mercy? And you're like, yeah, the mercy is I'm not giving this knife to you. That's literally what the mercy is. So sometimes we adopt this Christian understanding that mercy must be that Allah does whatever makes me happy. That if he just keeps me happy all the time and I get whatever I want in life, that's mercy. No. It is that Allah does what he knows in his infinite wisdom and knowledge, that what is best for us. And it's tough because sometimes we don't see it that way. We don't see how it could be good for us. And so often in life, Allah shuts the door, and down the line we were like, thank God. Man, initially I was hurt. Like I thought, why would he shut that door on me? And then I heard about what a toxic workplace that was, and I'm like, okay, thank God. Got saved from that one. But in the moment, all we could see was, Ya Allah, why would I get rejected from that job? Do you understand? Mercy is not Allah gives you whatever you want. No, this is a very Christian understanding. Tarbiyah is not that you give your child whatever they want. That's permissive parenting. You also don't want to be authoritarian where you just, you know, dominate the child. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us free will. Certain things he holds us back from, we just don't have the capacity for it. And that's our challenge, is can we accept our limits? Can we accept our limits? We can't understand everything. We, it's not possible to know everything. Do you understand that? And that's part of our duty as the, as the servant of God. Is Allah's given me free will. But certain things he's just blocked off. I can't guarantee them. I had someone come to me once, Shaykh, how do I know if I'm doing enough? I say, you'll never know in this world. Always try, do the best you can. No, but I need to know, like, I'm doing enough in the sight of God. I'm not God. I don't have access to the scoreboard to see where you are, like, are you in Jannah or not? I don't know. And neither do you. And nobody knows. You can just do the best you can. No, but I want to know, Sheikh. You can't. It's like you can't know what's coming tomorrow. 
no, but maybe if we just do a little bit more research. No. It's a limitation. You don't know what comes tomorrow, no matter how much research you do. And no matter how many scientists you bring together, it's a limitation, a human limitation. And that's part of our job, is to accept that we won't know everything. But we do have free will to choose in our capacity what we want to do. So Allah does not force us, but he also does not leave us to do whatever we want. There's, there's an in-between, a balance. Right? So Allah is ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And Allah being the Rabb, if we consider the very beginning of the Qur'an to be Bismillah, we begin with what? Bismillah. Allah is the Rabb, and so we start everything Bismillah. When we say, what, how do we translate Bismillah, by the way? In the name of Allah. What does that even mean? Have you ever thought about that? What does in the name of Allah mean? You're doing it for the sake of Allah? Okay, what else? You know the letter ba here has many different meanings in Arabic. Just the one letter ba, the preposition, the harful jar. It can mean, it can mean with the name of Allah, the ba lil ma'iyah, that with the name of Allah. What does it mean when you're with something or someone? You're not what? You're not alone. How often in life do we face situations with what? We feel all alone. Because maybe we lost somebody from our life. You know, when someone loses a parent, it feels like the cloud that was shading you from the sun is removed and you're just left on earth to just fend for yourself. In the past, what? You face a difficulty, you look to your parents, hey, can you help me? Can you guide me forward? You lose a parent and now you're just alone. You lose a spouse, you're just alone. You lose a friend, a friendship, you know, like grieving over a friendship, you feel very alone. What does Bismillah teach us? In every situation, you're with Allah. You have the help of Allah with you. That you don't move forward all alone. Honestly, this is so powerful. That you walk into an exam, psychologically, Bismillah. Ya Allah, I'm not going to write this all by myself, trusting myself. Ya Allah, I write this trusting that you're with me and you're going to help me, inshallah. You're going to guide me. Inna ma'ya rabbi sayahdeen. This is the Prophet Ibrahim said, my Lord is with me and he'll guide me forward. That's bismillah. The rabb. Do you understand? I'm going to finish with two points here. One is, one of the things we notice in the Quran is when the prophets would make dua to Allah, do you know, do you know the wording they would use very often? Is rabbi. Rabbi inni, right? Rabbi inni nazartu lil Rahmani, sawman. Qala Rabbi inni da'autu qawmi laylan wa nahara. The prophets would say, Rabbi. How do we translate Rabbi? Anyone? My Lord. That's very different than Allah is ar Rabb, the Lord. No, 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 no. He is the Lord, no doubt. But He's also my Lord. There's a difference between calling someone brother. Or saying, my brother. What's the difference? There's a personal relationship. There's a closeness. There's a closeness. Right? It's a person. Now, this is my person. Like, this, is, this is like my guy. You know, people say that is my guy. Is my, when we attribute it to ourselves, there's a special connection. When we make dua, do we make dua with Rabbi? Oh my Allah, oh my Lord. Imagine we speak to our Lord like that, my Lord. You know when a parent says, my child, come here, right? My father, my Lord, right? My father, when you speak to our parents, my mom, my dad. Just, there's a power to it. Imagine we begin to really nurture this relationship with Allah, invest in it. And that's what these gatherings are really about. So I'm really, I'm so happy we're doing these gatherings. The amount, <laughs> I want to do a survey right now. How many of y'all have had me tell you you need to learn the names of Allah? <laughs> a lot of hands will probably go up. The amount that I give this advice, learn the names of Allah. And everyone goes to me, where? And I was like, yeah, we don't really have a halaqa for it. And it's like, okay, now we got a halaqa for it. 
Because when you learn about Allah, you begin to truly feel close to him and near him. And then you start to really believe he's my Lord. Like I have my own relationship with him. He is the Lord of all, Rabbul Alameen. But me, subjectively, I know and I feel that I have a personal relationship with him. That I can talk to him. That I can communicate with him. That he will respond to me. That's how prophets used to speak. And that's how we should teach our children to talk to Allah as, oh my Lord, he's yours, he's your Lord. There's a love to it, there's a love to it to say, my Lord. Okay, um, there's a lot more I wanted to say, but I wanna finish with living with the names of Allah in our lives. One of them is to, when it comes to the name Arab, is to use the name Rabb when we seek refuge. We find this in the Quran. قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الناس. The word Rabb is used here when we seek protection. I'm seeking the protection of the Rabb, of the darkness of night, the splitting of the darkness of night. What are we saying here? That in life, sometimes we find ourselves in darkness, not sure what to do, where to go. I seek refuge in the, the one who splits the darkness to bring about day. The one who can bring day and light into my darkness in, my, in, in, in the situations in my life. The one who can protect me from other people. The Prophet ﷺ would make dua at night time and he'd recite these duas, sorry, these surahs. He would recite, قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ And then he would make a motion of and he would blow it over his body to protect himself. Rabb. Another way, as Allah is the Rabb to us, that we be people of tarbiyah in our lives. We nurture the people around us. Allah is a sabur He's patient with us. He's al-halim. We wrong and he just forbearing. We must also be people who are patient with those around us. And when you have children, it's really hard. It's very difficult. I understand. Right? But it's an effort that I'm trying to be somebody of tarbiyah with the people around me. Give them space, give them time. Recognize that what? It'll take time for people to grow. Sometimes in our love for someone, we can't be patient with them. Like we wanna see them change. Yesterday, hey, listen, nobody loved people more than the Prophet wasallam. And his love and concern for them brought them closer. If your love and concern for people are pushing them away, you're doing it wrong. No, but Shaykh, I care. I get you care. But you must also learn how to express your care. It's not just having the right intention. It's approaching it with the right approach. The Prophet Wasallam's love and concern for people brought them closer and pushed them away. And sometimes our genuine, I believe you, you like you genuinely care, I know. But sometimes that expressed in the wrong way pushes people away. And so we have to be very careful that we're nurturing, we're true, you know, tarbiyah like the prophets, learn from the stories of the prophets. And finally to call upon Allah with this name, Rabb, Rabbi, Rabbi, Ya Allah, I need protection from you, I need help from you, Rabbi, my Lord, my Rabb. All right, inshallah, uh, we're going to stop here um, and we're going to do a kahoot, inshallah. All right? Jazakumullahu khayran. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. We got gift cards today too, guys. So, bismillah, let's see who's going to win.